Hi, so last time I talked about different types of error rate, per comparison error rate, family-wise error rate, and FDR. And throughout all of that, I was kind of assuming the voxels were independent. So today, what I wanted to do was just do a run through a couple of simulations to show what happens when we smooth our data. And I'm going to be focusing on per comparison error rate and just illustrating, you know, how it gets tricky. We can't even estimate the error rate or guess what the error rate will be. You'll see what I mean. So make sure you're ready for this. Uh, you should know the different approaches for controlling error rates. If you don't, please go back to PCER, FWER, FDR, and watch that video. So there is MATLAB code for this. Um, you can just go to the info box on the YouTube video and the link to the code will be there. It's right, as I said, it's a MATLAB script and I'll be running through the script. Primarily that's all I'm doing today. So again, I wrote this script to just highlight what we're dealing with with correlated data. So our images typically have correlated voxels. Not typically, they're always going to have correlated voxels. Even if we didn't smooth our data, as we typically do with fMRI data, we apply some type of smoothing kernel with some full width half maximum um, Gaussian to our data. Even if we don't do that, the data are already smooth. Um, due to various purpose, to, uh, reasons. So what does that mean in terms of counting false positives? Typically, the number of false positive is equal to whatever your false positive rate is. So I'm using 0.05 since that's what we typically use, times the number of independent tests. Now this is where things get tricky. If your voxels are correlated, how many independent things do you actually have? So the MATLAB demo is going to look at this. We're going to simulate null data, so there won't be any active voxels in the brain, just noise. And we're going to look at first when things are uncorrelated. How many false activations will we find? Well, that equation on the previous slide, we can actually compute it then, because we know the number of independent tests in that case will be the number of voxels. Then I'm going to spatially smooth the data with a Gaussian kernel and show you how that changes. Okay, so let's go to that. So again, you'll be looking for this uh, day 28 error rates script. And this first simulation is just working with, as I said, unsmoothed data. So I'm simulating data for a patch of voxels that's 100 by 100, so there will be 10,000 voxels total. Each voxel has data for 30 subjects, so I'll have a 100, 100 by 100 by 30 uh, matrix of data. And I'm simulating data under the null, so I'm just going to crank them out of a standard normal data simulator. So number of voxels, number of subjects. I'm starting by just creating a vector and then reshaping it. And the vector is just um, um, drawn from the normal distribution. So if we look at the size of that, it's 100 by 100 by 30. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to loop through each voxel and I'm going to run a one sample t-test and save the p-value in this p-image. And then we will look at the p-image. So this is basically going to create something that looks very similar to those simulated data illustrations that I showed the last time for illustrating PCR, FWER, and FDR, except those simulations had signal and these don't. So same idea though. I should be able to just, now my null voxels are all of them, so 5% of those should be active. So running this chunk, and I'm going to look at the image of p-values that results. And you get this. It should look roughly like that. And then I'm going to threshold it at 0.05. So just as in the illustration from last time, if the voxel's white, that indicates it was found significant. So when you look at this, you might be saying to yourself, well, I would never consider anything that looks like this to be true activation. So why don't I just use that to determine if I'm looking at a false positive or not? Well, that's only because these data were not spatially smoothed. You will see in the next example that when the data are smooth, 
um, there's really no way to tell the difference between um, a blob that's false positive, a false positive versus a blob that's a true active. So then we can look at the type one error rate, looking at the average, basically the P image less than 0.05, this is going to be a vector of ones and zeros. And if I take the mean of it, that'll tell me um, the proportion of ones. So I get 0.0486, really close to 0.05. If I had more voxels, it would probably be right on the nose, but very close. Um, I can run it a couple of times, maybe just one or two, because I don't wanna waste a lot of time doing this. Um, and we'll see that we consistently get the same answer, which was what we guessed, point, around 0 0.05. One more time. Great, 0 0.05. So now, what happens when we smooth the data? So to do that, I'm gonna use a Gaussian kernel. So this is the kernel function right here. If you don't know much about this, I invite you to look it up. It's just basically a Gaussian function with a uh, variance sigma squared. Um, you can I d definitely play with this kernel, change sigma, change the radius of the kernel, and play with it and see what it does. So for this, I'm gonna leave sigma set at 10, um, but what I'm gonna change is the radius of the grid. So this just um, tells you how, how wide you're going for the voxels that you're, you're smoothing. So I'm gonna actually start with 10. So here's my Gaussian kernel. I'm simulating the data the same way as I did above. And then I'm creating my, my weight matrix. So let's see what this, this is pretty to view. So this is just a matrix here. Right, so see, it's just a Gaussian. And the rad grid set to 10, that's setting the radius of uh, the grid that I'm using. So this is going to average, do this weighted average within this grid around each voxel. So you center this around the voxel of interest, do the weighted average according to these weights, and you assign that value to the center voxel, scoot it over, um, repeat. So just typical uh, spatial convolution. Okay, so I'm going to use 10 to start. And going to go through and apply it for each subject, and then I'll show you what it looks like. So here's one subject's data. So you can see this is pretty smooth. Uh, if it weren't smooth, this would look pretty speckly. And then I'm going to repeat what I did before and run my one sample t-test. And I am going to do everything we did before. So. I'm going to do the thresholded image and then compute how many voxels were significant, what percentage of the data were significant. So kind of close to 0.05, but it isn't exactly. And now you can see, so these are all false positives because I simulated null data. See how when you smooth your data or when your data are smooth, I should say. So again, even if I don't smooth my bold data, they're inherently smooth you get things that look like they could be real. So let me run this section again, and we'll see what the error rate is. So now it's below 0.05, and we'll do a quick see. There's the activation, and one more time, and then I'll change the radius. So now it's far below 0.05, and it looks like this. Okay, so now let's change the radius to something kind of ridiculous. Let's go up to 80. Um, yeah, I'll just run this. So this, this will be smoothing it out more. So now you can see this is much higher, above 0.05. One last time. Much higher, above 0.05. So, the point is, again, we can't, oops, oops, don't do anything. We can't really predict what this number is because we don't know what the number of independent things is for this data set. So even if there was a way to compute it because we are controlling the smoothing here, um, for our real data, it's really hard to compute. So some methods do have a way of doing it. So the random field theory based approach 
that I will show you. It's a voxel-wise random field theory approach, and it does have a way of estimating the smoothness, and that enters the family-wise error rate correction that it does. But um, that isn't the answer. And we'll see with Bonferroni, part of the reason Bonferroni fails is because Bonferroni is set up for independent voxels, and we don't have that. So long and short of it, the smoothness of our data kind of give us an extra challenge. So if we could count false positives, we could actually just use Bonferroni and fix it, but we can't. And again, next time I'll talk all about Bonferroni and I'll actually have simulations for Bonferroni. That's it. Make sure you have that. Um, play with the code on your own. See how the results change. That is always fun to do. And now what we're stuck with is not knowing how many independent things we're working with because our data are smoothed and we don't even know what that smoothness looks like. And just to add to that, um, you might be thinking, well, temporal autocorrelation, we were able to fit a model and characterize the temporal autocorrelation. It's much more difficult with spatial smoothness because we have the brain anatomy and all that. Um, right, so we're now, as we move forward, I want you to keep in the back of your head, well, how is the smoothness of the data affecting this approach? Or how does this approach adapt to that? Um, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. Again, join the Facebook group. Link for that in the info box. It's just called Mumford Brain Stats. And have a great day.